So this is Peter with Talking About Local Talk. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to be talking about Apple Talk and New York Talk, which was Apple's answer to networks in the Macintosh and the Apple II. Apple Talk was Apple's choice of networking from about 1984 through about 1994, and then Apple Talk persisted until about 2009 when it was supposed to drop Mac OS. The first question we want to ask is why do we want to bother with Apple Talk in this case? We have Ethernet, we have wireless networks, we have much better network technologies. I think the Apple Talk is still useful and relevant for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's the only network technology well integrated, transparent on the Apple QGS and the Apple II workstation card. There, yes, there are other file sharing solutions, but they don't appear as disk drives on the Apple II. They're not as nicely integrated. They're, in some respects, more difficult to use. Second, Apple Talk and Local Talk are thoughtfully designed technologies, and there's still a lot we can learn from the way they did it. There's a lot that we learned about computer networks in general from watching what they did. Back in 1983, your network, network was much different. Today, any computer you buy, it has networks built in. It has wireless networking. It probably has wired networking unless you bought a MacBook Air. But it's just there, it just works. You walk into any coffee shop, your wireless network works. No further effort required, your web browser works. Much required. Back in 1983, networking was a different world. Every vendor had their own incompatible networking protocol. I almost think that the vendors took pride in creating their own completely incompatible protocol. We had developed network, we had period protocols from IBM, Xerox, and of course Microsoft had the protocol at the time. And of course Apple wanted to add its own protocol. And there are good technical reasons for that. Part of it was there was no accepted way of doing networking, no existing way of, of handling networking. Did everything that everyone really needed. So so every vendor was motivated to try something different in hopes that it would solve some of the problems that were there. In 1983, network was very expensive. You pay over a thousand dollars for an Ethernet port on your computer. These quotes come from Inside Apple Talk, which is one of the which is a very well written book going into technical details of how Apple Talk works. I'll touch on a bit of that. Networking systems were they called foreign appendages, seen independently of computers and then only as an afterthought. The whole idea of a network being easy to use and not requiring an expensive, dedicated system administrator, specialized servers, was foreign at that time. Networks were much more difficult than they were today. Networks appear to be celebrations of technology designed with more attention to such issues and data transmission speed than the user can use. The users of network services had to learn the idiosyncrasies of each particular network. Remember, every vendor had their own way of doing things, it wasn't compatible with any other way. The network constituted hindrance when it should have extended the user's reach. Apple has been actively working on this problem, trying to introduce their own network technology. Their, their first attempt was called AppleNet, never released, you know, targeting a price point of about $500 per port. Still too expensive, still too difficult to use. It was based on the Xerox XNS protocol, which you know nothing about. But the problem with that approach is it didn't fit with the, the model that they wanted for the Macintosh. Apple, Steve Jobs, one that's kind of easy to use, plug it in, it works. Along with the Macintosh in 1984, Apple introduced what they called Apple Bus, later became Apple Talk. In 1984, Apple Talk did not actually exist. They announced it, but it didn't work. 
It was another year, 1985, until Apple Talk actually shipped. It was called the Apple Talk Personal Network. Later, they changed the terminology a bit. We'll talk about that later and why. So the goals for Apple Talk were with diverse all, with plug and play, plug the cable in, it worked. You didn't have to deal with terminators, hubs, and servers, network configuration, or things that made network so difficult to spend in that network. It was peer to peer. Any other approaches to network you needed a server. Initially, Apple Talk only supported printer sharing. I think it was largely because Apple was promoting the laser writer printer, which was very expensive and practical for it to be attached to. In practical, we had multiple laser writers, one for each computer, so they needed to share. Later, we had file sharing as well as other service, services. Apple Talk was designed to be simple. Again, plug it in, go. I'll show you some examples of why Apple Talk was simpler than the alternatives. Link independence. Apple, even at this early stage, had the vision that while well, technology is going to change, there's going to be other types of cabling. Apple initially used what they called um, the Apple Talk cabling using a uh, three pin cable with a actually eight position connector at the end. It's the same thing that you see on the back of uh, the Macintosh producer serial ports or GPS or Tuesday Plus. But at this time, Apple had the vision that, okay, there will be other things down the line. They wanted to design a system that would allow them to transparently add or replace the cable in the physical layer of the whole layer of the network, for example, internet or token ring. They wanted, they wanted look, Apple Talk to be a seamless extension of the engineer. On the Apple, on the Apple II or the Apple II communication card, the printers and um, Disk drives appear to be local. You can use it with existing software without having to buy your existing software. And lastly, Apple wanted their networking staff to be an open architecture. By open architecture, I don't mean open source. The idea of open source was <coughs> unrelated to the need for open architecture. Remember, one of the problems with networking back in 1980 is every vendor did things their own way. There were emerging standards for how a network, networking software, networking system should be organized, the terminology that you should use. This architecture provided a way to break up the network stack, the networking software into pieces, different layers, and then replace those individual layers as the technology advanced and changed. That's what Apple is referring to as the open architecture. Specifically, they had in mind the uh, ISO OSI standard. 1986, we finally got the TPS with Apple Talk built in. In 1987, we got the Apple Workstation card, which allowed you to have Apple Talk networking on or Apple TV. There's a picture of the workstation card. It originally came up for QE89. Notice how complicated this card is? <laughs> On the Macintosh, it was much easier because the processor is fast enough to handle the work of implementing the Apple Talk protocol. On the early 2E, it wasn't fast enough. There is a 6502 processor right here. I own dedicated 6502. I'll run it independently. The Apple Talk network is stack running down. 1987, we also got a Apple Talk card for the PC. And later in 1992, we also got this card, which was an Apple Talk card. If remember, at least this one is, is Tony's card that allows you to do Apple Talk over. Even this card has a 65816 on it. Ethernet would be much faster than the original Apple Talk implementation, even the 2GS comes up. Well. The 2GS as is, as it ships, can barely keep up with the Apple Talk network. You say that would never ship? Correct. This is. 
I'll back up. The 2GS ships with Apple Talk built in using what they later called the local talk cabling. And with the 2GS, it was fast enough that it didn't need a separate processor on it. The GS 65CA16 could handle the implementation of the networking stack. Most of it was running software. Uh, when Ethernet came along, this card is the dated 1982. Ethernet is quite a bit faster than local talk cabling. Again, needed its own processor for the system to be able to keep up with the internet. Unfortunately, this card was never released. Uh, Tony has a fantastic way to detail the history of the card and some of the reasons why it was never released. But the fact is, 1982 is too late in the life cycle of Apple II for a good financial choice for them. So I mentioned that the terminology changed a bit over the years. Apple Talk first came out, they called it the Apple Talk Personal Network. Then a few years later, they split that term out and changed it a bit. What happened is, Apple Talk first came out, it implied a certain type of cabling. It implied these round, eight pin cabling that later became called local talk. <coughs> the round, eight pin connector like this, Apple Talk cable, as uh, I mentioned earlier, Pin, so you'll see the long Apple Talk cable for three pins, just because three pins was cheaper than, than all eight. At that time, the term, the term Apple Talk changed from its original meaning. Apple Talk was a generic term that applied to the entire networking approach. Local Talk referred to the original cabling. Ether Talk referred to Apple Talk using Ethernet at the time, which would have been primarily 10 base 2 networking and coax. So, uh, 10 base T using the symbol of both people, not quite at that time. Uh, initially, we had version 1 of EtherTalk, then we had version 2 that came out in 89. Uh, almost nobody uses version 1.0 of EtherTalk. You can find it documented in the site Apple Talk at this point. And E2 server does not support version 1, Linux does, because Linux does not support it version 1. There is also support for Apple Talk using. Token ring, they call that token talk. Apple Talk also grew a bit from its original vision to support large, larger networks of computers. It was called phase two networks sometimes, or also extended versus the original, which was also called non extended. Apple Talk networks could have bridges, so you could have multiple network segments all connected together, so you could build very large networks in campus wide. Complex <coughs> the term bridge really isn't the right term if you can call the uh, OSI terminology. It's more accurately called a, uh, a router. So by the time you got to the phase two Apple Talk, I you know, want to say it was the seven <coughs> moment. But by the time you got to phase two Apple Talk, you get renamed bridges to internet routers. This is internet with a lowercase i. At this time, the internet as we know it did not exist. They were using the term internet in the generic sense of many networks connected together. The term Apple Share refers to Apple's file sharing software that ran on that. This diagram shows how Apple Talk fits into the OSI standard that will be in architecture. At the bottom, we have what's called the physical layer that represents the cabling. The electronic part of it, then we work our way up, we have link access, network, transport, session, and presentation. Uh, at the presentation layer, we have some of the things that you, as the end user, are most likely to see, like file sharing and credit sharing. And these that are all complicated pieces that are necessary to make that function work, work for you. I'm going to focus on the bottom two layers here, the physical layer and the link access layer. That's what changes when you're switching between the original cabling called local talk, ether talk, and token talk. Already mentioned cabling a bit. With local talk, it uses what's called a bus topology, which means that the computers are connected together in a line. There's no loops, there's no central point where it connects to one computer after another. And there, there are these uh, small boxes attached to each computer. 
I've been called a transceiver. Um, in some of the Apple documentation I've seen calls it a connector. Basically, there's a small cable, a pigtail, that connects to the back of your computer on the QGS. It connects to what's, what looks like a serial port. It's actually much more than a serial port. And on the Macintosh, it connects to the port. On the back side of that, there's two plugs that allow you to use a daisy chain located across the different computers without whatever link the cable can be between them. This is a picture of the connector kit that Apple sells. So you see a couple of those transceivers or connectors here with all those cables. There's another picture. And here you can see the three different kinds of connections. The cable back here. This particular picture is of a connector kit with a DD9 connector. Yes, and And over here on the, on the other end, you see two connectors for crazy <coughs> Inside of that box, what's inside there? At the same time, it's interesting what's in there, but it's surprisingly simple. Inside that box, this is the schematic from inside uh, Apple Talk. We have a handful of resistors and capacitors, which are there for, for controlling electromagnetic interference. We have the connectors with isolation transformers. And probably the most interesting part to me is the, is the automatic termination. We have any network with the bus topology with computers on the line. We have two computers, one in each end, with nothing connected. The ends of the, the ends of that bus, the ends of the cabling is called a terminator on it. The, when you're using the Apple Clock connector kit, it automatically terminates depending on whether or not you plug something in. <coughs> I don't know what that cost Apple, but it's a surprisingly nice and clean feature. There's nothing to lose. You have extra parts you have to plug in. Even though Apple Clock is relatively inexpensive. It's still too expensive for a lot of people. As I pointed out, a lot of people use the uh, phone net connectors just because they're less expensive and you need less expensive cable. Then that goes into the back of your computer and the bus goes into the other end. Here we see the terminators. These, the equivalent function, are built into the Apple brand. Saving the cost of switches. Yes. Which is probably more the most expensive part of the, of the setup. But when you're using phone net, you have these goofy little things that you hope you don't lose, and you hope you find when you need it, and you have to plug it into the very end. Otherwise, your network won't work. One thing about that is the network would work. You know, you'd go, oh, cool, I just, I just, I just scored. I plug all this crap in. It doesn't matter. I didn't need it. It works, and it works until it doesn't. And then it doesn't work until you plug those things in. Yep, unterminated bus so will create all kinds of echoes. I can pass these around. Take a look at them. Back up when you're done. More about local talk. <laughs> <laughs> Again, local talk is the initial type of cabling that Apple released with Apple Talk. I don't have any choices. Um, local talk is plugged into the same port as a serial port on your computer, but it is not a serial, it is not compatible with the serial port that you're used to. So to start with, local talk transmits information at a rate of 234 kilobits per second. It can have a length of 300 meters and up to 32 computers attached to them. It is multi drop which means that multiple computers <coughs> have 32 and attached to the same cable. You can't do that with the regular RS232 serial port. You're lucky to get 115 baht out of a, I'm sorry, 115,000 baht out of a regular serial port. 
you're not getting the speaker meters out of it either. You're lucky to get a few meters out of it. And you only get two computers on an each end. So how does local talk pull this off? To start with, we use a different type of signal. RS-232 versus RS-422. RS-422 is a standard that defines what the voltages are, what the type of cable you use, the characters you want to cable it. Specifically, RS-422 is what's known as bell and the differential and isolated. The differential is probably the most interesting word there. With, with a regular serial connector, you have one wire for transmit, one wire for receive. With RS-422, it's either two for transmit and two for receive. That reduces the, it reduces the it reduces the effective noise on the cable, and uh, that's what allows you to the longer range and the larger number of nodes and higher speed. Interestingly, when you go through the connector box, you wind up with only three pins. If you want to do some magic there to cut down the number of pins. But you still get pretty good performance out of it, despite that. But that's not all that is different about local talk signaling. It uses what's called FN0, or by phase space line coding. This is FN0 is sort of like how information is encoded on your five recorder inch floppy disks. Remember when your five recorder inch floppy disk, there are certain when you're trying to read information off a of disk, you need to be able to synchronize to the disk and then figure out where does the fight start, where does it end. And there's a complicated technique of what you can write, how you have to write it, how you have to read it, to be able to synchronize to that screen. With FM0 line coding, it does something similar. It gives you very interesting that there is a transition that we use between three to four microseconds on the line and add extra transition to try to catch the data. This allows, this makes the implementation of the receiver hardware much simpler. If you have a regular RS-232 serial port, the receiver needs to sample the line several times faster than the baud rate. Not so bad when you're at 96 kilobaud, but now if you're trying to pull off 224 kilobaud per second, you need to maybe sample that 8 or 16 times over, it becomes more difficult for them. So, FM0 works around that problem, it makes the implementation easier, it makes the system less susceptible to variation of the clock between the different uh, computers on the system. Third, local talk uses an IBM technology called Synchronous Data Line Control Frame. And all that means is how the information is packaged up and ordered on the network, how the headers show up. Talk a bit more about that later. So, what, so what's the result of all this? Even though it's the same plug in the back of your computer, when you start using that for local talk networking rather than serial port, a lot of different stuff happens. Let's go take a look at the schematic of the TCS, and I'll show you some of the stuff that's happening inside the TCS. <coughs> Mysterious package with H5. It's actually a T network filter, a bunch of resistors and capacitors inside of there, and that does two things. First, it reduces the electromagnetic interference, and second, it provides some fault tolerance. If the line driver inside the GS fail, it will, in some cases, prevent that, that machine from taking down the entire network. 
next uh, label
the SCC part of the processes and the parts of the brain will take off. So that's the first step. You've got this counter. Even before it gets to the serial hardware and starts coding things, you can very quickly detect other activity online. There's still a window when you look at something, and if that happens, it's what's called a collision. When a collision occurs, local talk does what we call assume. I mean, it assumes that the printer remember it and it's actually detecting collision. It can only assume a collision occurred if it didn't get the information back and needed in a particular time. If both <coughs> checks the linked activity detector via MSC1 or MSC1 or MSCX1 lines, find those activity, and it does what's called infer, which means it just waits, which is not as big of a deal as actually assuming there's a collision and then backing off. It takes, a lot, it takes a lot of time. So, if there's no activity on the line, then your you will try to start transmitting your brain. It starts off with what's called a synchronization pulse. The synchronization pulse is something that the SCC, the Serial Communications Controller, can detect relatively quickly. Not as quickly as the counter that I mentioned. But again, local clock are trained very hard to avoid those collisions. <clears throat> Can't detect them, they're very time consuming to recover from. So, get the synchronization pulse. Then you get a series of flag bites with a brain preamble. This, this gives the hardware <coughs> time to synchronize to the clock. It, it takes at least two byte times worth of these flag bites to recover the clock. And here's another opportunity to avoid a collision. If the points of flag bytes are transmitted, every single controller is connected to the local clock network will detect these flag bytes. So we have a third way of well, the three. We have another way of detecting if there's activity in the network because we don't want to cause a collision. It's all about avoiding the collision. Then we transmit our data, we'll jump back to. We get down to here, it's called the frame trailer. We have a frame check sequence, which is which just checks on the CRC, the 16 bit CRC. And we finish off with another flag in the abort sequence. The flag in the abort sequence caused all of the controllers on your network to lose the clock, lose what they, what they call sync. And that allows all the nodes to detect when the network is free. So you can see there's, there's multiple levels of what's happening here to make sure that we avoid the collision. There's also timing restrictions on local talk. There's timing restrictions on how quickly a node needs to respond to the transmission. And if the, trans if the response doesn't occur, then somehow your information didn't get out, and it was probably a collision. So again, as soon as it collision in that case. <coughs> that timing also makes local talk difficult. It's not, it's difficult to implement even on the faster GPS. It, GPS is fast enough, but it's still difficult. It's not, it's not possible to implement it on a 2D without having the separate workstation. Let's talk a bit more about all the stuff that's in between. Assuming we actually got to the point where I don't think there's a collision happening or going to happen. We're ready to transmit something. We then get into this new part called the LLAP packet. LLAP stands for Local Talk Link Access Protocol. Older documentation will call the same thing the Apple Talk Link Access Protocol before Apple invented the term Local Talk. And at this level, there's yet another way to avoid collisions. There's something called Quest to send and clear to send. You see this field LF type, it has to be before a node can transmit. It has to send out one of these one of these frames with the LF type set to request to send. And then make sure it gets back to clear to send before it can transmit. Request to send and clear to send packets are short, reducing the chance of a collision, and reducing the cost of recovering from the collision when you transmit it. Backing off. Your actual data is probably much larger. Your modern Wi Fi networks use the same request to send and 
filters and mechanisms just to work around or deal with the same type of problem. The start of every LF <coughs> starts with a node ID, send it, the source ID you are sending it from. Every computer on a local talk network has a number that identifies it from, well, 1 to 254. Zero is not valid. 255 is for broadcast, which transmits to every computer on the network. So those are, those are special and are values. Local talk also provides a way of automatically assigning these node IDs. You might remember you might remember having to manually type IP addresses in your computer. Localclock doesn't want you to have to configure right addresses. So there's a protocol where using two types of what they call control packets. Okay. Right here where it's a LF packet in the middle, where when a node starts up, it asks for an address, you use what's called an inquire packet, and it listens to what they call acknowledge packets. And through the algorithm that Apple carefully documented, a computer will go through and find the key address and sign it itself. So that's part of what allows you to just plug your computer in to local talk. It just works. There's nothing in configure because local talk does it for you. This LF packet can also contain data. Now that's that's where things start to get interesting. We've gone through all this work to finally build up our to transmit these local talk things, the ultimate goal is to be able to transmit data so we can build these more interesting services like file sharing, print sharing. And this little piece right in the middle is your data. Right? You get 600 bytes. So this local talk frame is the foundation of all the other, I'll say, higher level, more useful, well, maybe more useful is not the right term, but more visible to the user services that you do with Apple Talk. So I stop here momentarily. Any questions about this? I know there's a lot here. If you don't need to understand it, except to realize that the people behind local talk worked very hard to build a low cost <coughs> solution for the network. Yes? Is all of the collision avoidance and um, RTS, uh, CTS kind of stuff? Where local talk and then Apple talk later on got the um, reputation of being chatty. I believe that this is specific to local talk. So there would be a little bit of chattiness in the local talk network. I don't think the reputation came from this. Because once you start going over the senses, <coughs> you're probably not using local talk for that connection. Um, the issue comes from the higher level protocols like the routing protocol called RTMP or what they call the zone information protocol, ZIP. And there, that protocol required fairly frequent transmissions of routing information and fairly large packets of routing information between the nodes. We got in phase two, it got a little bit better. They, in the routing protocol, they introduced something called a split horizon, the last word of it, but split horizon processing, I believe, is the term that inside Apple Talk uses. That cuts down the chattiness. Basically, the split horizon approach says only transmit a subset of the routing information to all the other nodes. You don't need to transmit at all. But I think that the chattiness came from the zip and routing stuff, which was alleviated some of the ways too. Yeah. Apple Talk has always had that reputation. Whenever I, whenever I went in to try and talk to uh, get get Max on the network, and <coughs> Windows. Uh, machines on the network, it was the the IT folks would always say, "Oh, the Apple talk, Apple Talk is so is so noisy, it's so chatty, it, it messes up our it messes up our stuff. That's why the router doesn't doesn't support it or whatever." And it's just it seems like it seems like kind of an old uh, an old fashioned idea of you know we were probably talking about the old versions of it, not the IP versions of it in, in you know, the later years. So yeah. I was just wondering if that if that might have kind of kicked that off. There, there's certainly a little bit of overhead to all the collision avoidance stuff. My guess is by the time the network had me see it, it's probably routed on the switch house. Yes, right. And at that point, you're dealing with higher level protocols. There's fairly short windows for some of the routing stuff in the downloads that can be broadcast. Because Apple is trying to make this easy to configure. 
plug in, you want every company to be working seconds later. So quite a bit needs, there's going to be quite a bit of changing in this repetitive broadcast. Uh, yes, James. And each, each computer sets it up its own number. When you put a printer on there, it broadcasts here, they say, hey, I'm a printer and my number's. So, yes, when you plug the printer in, it goes through the name of the anatomy address assignment process using uh, the inquire and the acknowledge package in local talk. The printer will figure out its own address, you don't need to worry about it, and then on top of this, there's something called the name binding protocol that allows the computer to figure out the name and the address, how it can you know, exactly the name binding protocol looks up. So that's sent out within this LS range that says I want your printers to send me your address. At that point, your computer knows what the address is. Yes. Does it matter to Apple Talk? Well, I guess I'm going to this and buy a real What kind of chip is this? Not the not the local talk at this moment. It will matter, of course, to the software that you get installed. But all this is independent of the process we are running. There's implementations of Apple Talk and local talk and 65 of Qs, I see it when six. Just as long as it's fast enough to keep up with the time requirements. The time requirements are on the order of like three to four hundred microseconds. So it takes a fair bit of work for your GS to turn the computer out quick enough. Any other questions here? Wrap up by taking a look at our network stack diagram. We've just talked about the two lower levels the physical layer, the link access layer, and even then, we've only talked about local talk. There's also ether talk, and token talk, and there's even fiber optic versions of this. This is the foundation for everything else. Here is the routing protocol I talked about, which is the source of chainness. There is the zone information protocol, which is useful when you have large networks and you can divide it up into what they call zones. Over here is the name binding protocol that I talked about, which is what the printers use. File sharing uses the same name binding protocol. When you start up your GS, for example, on a local talk network, it sends out these name binding protocol lookups and says, Who's an AFP server? Who supports file sharing? And that information <coughs> goes straight into, into your uh, Apple Talks control panel. Up at the top here, we have the actual file sharing. Next to that, we have the printer access protocol. This was designed to be modular, so you can add more, you can replace pieces in here. That's what they meant by open architecture. You can build more software on top of it. You could write software. That directly use Apple Talk to do something other than just file sharing or printer sharing. These are three excellent references. Inside Apple Talk is a place I recommend starting. Apple used to have this available for free on their website. I don't know if it's there anymore, but you can go for some other copies. You can get a copy for less than 10 bucks at your favorite online retailer. The Xyla 853 data sheet is also excellent. That's this document talks about the serial communication controller. It talks about the particular type of modes that it's using for local talk. And also talks about a lot of other modes and capabilities that Apple doesn't use, and in some cases Apple does use. Lastly, there's the Apple Share Programmers Guide. This is how do we do how do we write software on the Apple II, particularly the Apple II S that uses the Apple Talk software. This is the other end of the, uh, of the stack that I talked about. I talked about <coughs> the two and the programmer's guide. We talked about how do we write the software that starts at the top and works its way down. 
Any other questions? Yes. I, I don't remember. Was there a connector that would allow you to connect to both the Apple three wire format and the phone app format? Yes, there's one. This magazine actually, surprisingly, for something like A Plus, has details about how to build your own converters and connectors just because um, I guess they thought the Apple provided ones, even the phone net provided ones, are too expensive. Yeah, the Apple provided ones are expensive. Did you know the cost of those when they came out? No. But I remember people complaining with that. And actually, you know, the big thing with the cables, buying those pre terminated cables, that was really expensive. Yeah, so there's still the cables. Yeah, if you wanted 100 foot in front of those, the connectors on the end of that. Yeah. I'm thinking from when I supported the Mac Local Talk Network, so it was probably on the order of $100 a seat. I was actually just going to say, I think the transceiver was about 100 bucks, whereas the phone nets were like 20 maybe? Yeah, 20 or 30. Yeah. That's a pretty significant station. So that, you know, I go into schools that would have an offer that had done the earlier Apple stuff, and then now that they went, it, it works good, and they figured out networking and have all these ideas, and then went and like deploy it. Down the whole hallway. Technically, it should be possible to convert between phone net and actual local talk Googling. All that's in those boxes, like I said, are pin resistors, capacitors, a transformer, and then in Apple's case, the uh, termination of the images on the outside of the phone net. So it should be possible to connect to it and say, well, you guys saw that I've been having. Yes, question. I don't know the dates of those. The Apple TGS did not do one. It had the ROM and media and connectors on the back. The workstation hardware did not. It also had the media and eight connectors. Well, AAUI was Ethernet, not, not local. Right. There, yeah, I misspoke there. But uh, or some by about the quarter seven hundred possibly two cables maybe. No, two CX didn't have no pennies. No, the two yeah, those had uh the connector which you could use in the AI Some of the local talk connectors on the Mac did have a one pin connector, which isn't the same as the UI, but a similar concept. And the only difference is a physical connector. Um, this had Ethernet version. I'm not mess with it, right? but this would be this would be Ether talk card, so this is the only time you saw a UI on the TGS. Were those ever released? I don't remember getting those. No, no. Okay. These Apple Ethernet cards are never released. Tony's the only person I knew who has them. He does have a web page with some excellent background on it. I got one. You said that? Excellent. Tron, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what a serial yes. number. Uh, anybody want to investigate uh, Mac IP, which is TCP over local for Apple Talk? It allows for GS and uh, a lot of your older Macs there that don't have Ethernet to uh, actually access uh, Ethernet. Yes. But, uh, By about 1994, it became pretty clear that Apple Talk it had, a, had a good run, but it wasn't the way for the future. TCP IP was the way for the future. And then we started shifting over to that. At that time, we started getting Mac IP as a, as a workaround for older computers. And we started getting native IP capability built on that. Unfortunately, by that time, uh, Apple wasn't interested in that. Yes. Yeah. That's when I started switching to Ethernet. That's a little by the wayside, but uh, still for older software hardware there. Great. Um, Mary has support for Mac IP, and I remember some discussion on CSA too recently about Mac IP to regular IP bridge that we necessarily use. Like box or something like that. Yes, a lot of the box like the box has been used. More questions? Yes. First slide there. Oh, she should have two more pins. Yeah. Yes. The 